When you guys do get together, whenever that happens, I suppose a lot of us fantasize you must talk movies. Oh, yeah. But instead, what? Recipes, vacations, a little bit gardening, kids, a little bit of gardening. gardening. <laughs> um, Russ is uh, the real job. thing, a real gardener. But uh, ah. my wife is, and I do laboring in the garden. But I love gardens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But Russ has really got into it and grown stuff. But the major yeah, which I love doing. But majority, it's it's about films we've seen yeah. or what might be coming up. Or films about gardening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and whether it was day of the film or digital. Day of the Triffids. <laughs> the day of the Triffids, exactly. Well, okay, um, when did, get back to Hanging Rock, when did you first know what you had on your hands? Was it before anybody actually saw it? I mean, when did you know this was really special? I thought when you said anything, you got something on your hands, it was how to make it in, a, in five weeks. <laughs> yeah, was it five weeks or shit? Yeah, oh, gee, weeks. I, I said that Paris was four. Oh, it might have been six, actually. Well, yeah. I might be wrong, too. Yeah, yeah. 30 odd days. I yeah. can't believe how we got through that in that time, you know? Yeah, when you sweet. see what the fabric of that film mm -hmm. and what's in it, Work fast. how are we doing it in five weeks? Well, we were looking at the big picture book. Yeah, oh, uh, wonderful see, stills. Yeah. yeah, it's back at the yeah, <laughs> back at home, ranch, ready for you to ranch. sign. But <laughs> at any rate, we were looking at those pictures, and he said that if it were to be shot today mm -hmm. with all of the modern equipment and everything else, wouldn't do it any differently anyway. Do it the way I it was done. Not. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, we had we had limited access to all sorts of paraphernalia and equipment. A because it was difficult to get up there, and B because there wasn't much available in Australia at that mm. time. No big cranes or anything like yeah. that. But I would have, I would hope we do would have done it mm. the same way. I mean, it wouldn't be made today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's right. a subject matter that of its time. Yeah. I would think. But again, when did you realize after the day to day? that what you had in the can was pretty special. I don't know that I ever... <laughs> I, I mean, I think is the phrase I tend to use is in, from the cutting room. Don't know, during the shooting, I think it's fair to say the dailies were pretty promising. You know, that, that we, we knew it, there was something interesting to follow. Yes, yeah, so I think that's what I mentioned before we, too. I mean, after the first three, four days of rushes, which came back 48 hours each day later after we'd shot them, mm. I think we started to understand that, you know, the elements were working yeah. with the location and the girls and mm. what Films. you were doing with them. Dailies teach you so much and I, I always have from those days till now have projected them in a theatrical setting as, as much of it mm. as mm -hmm. possible, giving it on location. But I love it to be filmed. Even today I don't really like, I never do just distribute DVDs and have people look at it at home. I say dailies are on, you know, as soon as we finish work we'll have food, something to drink. And uh, try and have a theatrical experience with the material. But do you remember your first full-fledged audience moment? Um, not particularly. I think that's in my case because, uh, firstly, going back to what you've got, I think there's a the phrase I use in the cutting room, you know, comes to mind is, it's not working. And then one day, if all is well, if the fate is with you, you say, it's working. And that lovely phrase, it's working, mm -hmm. doesn't mean necessarily the public will respond that way. It means that it's working in the way you intended it. And it's a great relief when that happens, sometimes at the 11th hour, uh, and occasionally not at all. Uh, then when you go and see it with an audience, it's a case of whether they're enjoying what you've done. You know, if they don't, then that's again, you know, just the luck of the draw. But at least you can say, that's right. what, I, what I want to do. Yeah. You know? But I don't think, um, I th think everything was so new. I mean, I was in Adelaide when it opened, living in South Australia. Uh -huh. All right, yeah. And I think one of the first thrills was seeing the front of house. It was a new um, Greater Union complex. First of a sort of, uh, you know, little complex yeah. of four cinemas Screens or something built or something, in yeah. 1975. Yep. We, were, we were right up a even maybe one of the first in the world country to uh, our distributors to rebuild theatres, convert suburban wow. theatres. Wow, oh yeah. And build um, multiplex. Multi screens, yeah. <laughs> so to go into this Adelaide thing and there was, um, what was on at the same time, it was, um, I think it was Godfather Part 2 uh, was showing and Picnic at Hanging Rock and they, they were very good materials, good stills, good um, uh, sort of, what do you call it, front of house, front of house. look. Um, marquee and uh, that was a thrill and then to see people hurrying in and lining up at the box office selling tickets for that picture, Picnic at Hanging Rock that was a thrill yeah. that was a thrill 
Sitting with audience is always uncomfortable. Not so much an affirmation for you, since you already knew what you had. Yeah, but a thrill there to be nonetheless. Seen. There to be seen, but it's a case of whether you um, have communicated it to a sufficient number of people yeah. to earn a profit. That's really. Do we overestimate the importance of that film in terms of getting American markets receptive to this new generation of filmmakers? I couldn't entirely answer it. I mean, I would tend to say, yes, it's possible to overemphasize it. I think it meant a great deal here, but it was not successful in America and took a long time to sell. In fact, in my case, the last wave, which I made afterwards, it was sold before Picnic. Really? Least before Picnic, and really? it, it helped get a sale with Picnic and Hanging Rock. But the fact that a mystery story did not have a solution, yeah. um, which was the challenge in making it, and hence the mood was critical, to create a mood in which the audience didn't want a solution. Well, you tell them straight away. Yes. They yeah. were never found. No. I mean, yes, that's, that's a gutsy that's thing right, to do. Exactly. And was necessary. So to, 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 to frustrate the natural desire to know who did it, or mm. what happened to the girls. Uh, so, in America, distributors found this is the problem with the film, and there's a, a famous story from one of our sales agents, and you know, the story came back that they'd screened it to some, such and such a distri distribu distributor, and he threw his coffee cup at the screen at the end, and he said, I've sat here all this time and there's no goddamn solution. <laughs> what a take. <laughs> And it did, it did found a home on college campuses. Indeed. Yeah. But um, I think then back home it was, um, it played a part in sort of encouraging people. They the first, you know, films to be released there, uh, get a release in America. Yeah. We, we you know we were picked up more in Europe first, uh, this new Australian industry mm. before the United States. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, England, you know, which was uh, sort of, as it were our old, uh, you know, uh, connections we had with mm -hmm. England. You know, it was nice to be have the film screen there. UK. Now, now granted that the subject matter of the last wave would have demanded a different kind of visual approach. Mm. Still, was there any tendency on either of your parts to deliberately go against the grain of Hanging Rock no, in your visuals so. and no, storytelling? No, no. It was a completely separate film, yeah. separate story a few years later. I, we didn't refer to picking at all in, in any way to say let's no. move deliberately away from picnic it. had gone you know it, it was again interesting to have lived through an era in which once a picnic the film was released and they hung around when they were hit for longer as you recall same in america i think it released in the capital cities and you got wonderful um you know actually bad business uh information but they would say it's the third month it's the third yeah. month and they didn't release it in the suburbs till it had more or less exhausted its city run. It, right, yeah. Today they would say, you want to get your money in the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it had gone and there would, would, would never be seen again except on perhaps one day on a midday movie or perhaps, um, you know, on a, on a revival house. So in those days, when you'd finished a film, they were pretty much gone except for maybe a copy being in the National Archive. Mm. So you moved to the next one. In this case of Russell Knight, the last wave. The last wave, yeah. Yep. And so you've, you've forgotten about it and you're thinking differently. Mm -hmm. And visually, you moved to the next one. You were that hard edged, more kind well, of lighting. You, you know, um, directors of photography often get classified, but I think we all like to turn our hands to different subject matter quite frequently. So to me, it was just some, it was another. Um, road to go down, it bore no relationship to Picnic and Hang Rock or probably anything that I'd done before. Mm. But um, And we did, I can't remember what you might have shown me in those days, but in prep, we talk quite a lot about the look of the film, don't we? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very, I can't remember the references we looked at, but a lot of night, a lot of yeah. rain. The rain was very interesting to mm -hmm. talk about. I've always loved being in a theatre when there's rain on the screen. I think it's But not in the theatre. Yeah. <laughs> Great <laughs> soundtrack, though, too. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. So we, we talked about it and I would say to Russ what I'm after in this scene or that scene, you know, to some extent we talk about talk like that and how are we going to do this? How will we do that? You know, there were kind of conversations. And but again, this sounds more like a collaboration yeah. than simply a director talking things over with his no, cameraman. It's, it's certainly, and then oh, yeah. what we have already discussed too, the collaboration on the set with the camera operator as well. Yeah. Mm. And John Seal was camera operator on that. On he was like a the third member of the team. Mm. Yeah, it's a definitely you know it's a three way mm. collaboration, mm. isn't it? All throwing in ideas and um, 
Peter rejecting them if he thought they were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, after 20 years, he comes to you and says, we're going to go stand on top of a high-masted <laughs> sailing ship. We're going to go to the Galapagos Islands. And you're saying, are you talking to me? <laughs> He's a sailor. Well, that's right. You have the yacht. Yeah. In fact, I didn't. I was going to tell um, uh, John the story that you, we actually, by totally by chance, I was going to LA to do some grading on a picture, and you were going to see Fox, I think, about the film, weren't you? Yeah, another meeting. And um, you, you, we were sitting right opposite each other. In those days, it was first class. We were right up the very front. The only passengers. I think we were the only passengers, passengers first, in class. first class, and. Um, you told me the whole story, and I got off off the plane and thought, oh, gee, I'd love to shoot that movie. And you called me, I don't really yeah. remember this, you called me in my yeah. hotel that night and yeah. said, I'm dropping we, the script around. Or, yeah. And then we met in a Thai restaurant. In a Thai restaurant, yeah. I remember it clearly. So day we, were, later, we, we started working on it on that plane. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how nice. Yeah. Oh, did, okay, okay. And it was literally on the plane, it was sort of, what are you going to LA for? And Russ said he's going to uh, great a great movie. movie. And I said, he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm... I think this is going to go. I'm in talks with Fox about this picture. It's based on a book of a series of books of seafarers, and uh, let's sit together, you know. And so, what are the, what's the picture you're grading, and what's the picture you're working on? Yeah, it was a, absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And within an X number of weeks, we were on the bounty on Sydney. Harbor. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yep, and then climbing the mast. <laughs> I was going to say, you, oh, we did, yeah. you're not doing things the easy way here. <laughs> There's we no easy we way had to get up there. We had to get up into uh, uh, up into the I think the, it was um, the fighting four tops. Mast. Yeah, through, yeah, through the futtock shrouds. Is that the picture I've seen of the two of you up? No, that was I think the one you've seen is the one on the set. We we're up at the very um, uh, um, bow of the ship. You know, I'm mm. sure you know that you remember that photograph. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We both got wet with the gear on, I think. But look, go back to Russ. Um, you know, I think I've mentioned to you on the phone that one of the things uh, with Russ that impressed me right from the beginning, and maybe it was what the first time I saw a picture of his, was how he handled uh, daylight. You know, it's one thing mm -hmm. um, many cameramen can handle moody night lighting, you know, particularly with dramatic uh, lighting effects, torchlight in a cave or something. Um, headlights flaring in the lens in an alleyway, somebody running, neon light flashing. But this, <laughs> middle of the day, uh, particularly in our country with its hard top light. Um, like today. You know, it's great in dawn, it's great, great at dusk. How do you shoot through the day? How do you get... And so Russ, I really noticed, had a terrific look in his day scenes. So there was one thing. The other thing Russ brought to me on a technical level was my first film was shot anamorphic. The first... Panavision anamorphic film ever photographed in this country. Panavision were new, the cars that ate Paris. And I burnt my fingers with it. I, I, I found the, you know, the, the Billy Wilder thing, great for shoot, shooting funerals and snakes, to be true. <laughs> it was too long and narrow. And it was Russell who uh, encouraged me to look at it for the year of living dangerously. Uh, because we're going up into Asia and we're going to be shooting, you know, in the rice fields and whatever. And he felt it was the best format for that picture and had experience in it and loved it. Yeah. Russ said to me, I love composing for animals. Yeah, thing. it's a real painterly frame. Yeah, so yeah. Cool. he eased me into it and it gave that film, Year of Living Dangerously, something else. It gave you, you could fill it with extras and it was, you know, the screen was alive with mm. information. It was wonderful. And well, to relax shooting close ups, just go for it. Just shoot it as if you were. Well, now, Sergei Eisenstein, to throw a reference to him in, 1930 proposed that the square was the ideal aspect ratio for a frame. Would you ever have been comfortable shooting in a square format? In black and white. For heights, especially. In black and white. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, it, it, put it another way, I think it makes sense in controlling the information the audience sees. One of the, the, the things to master with uh, anamorphic, mm -hmm. I think, beyond close-up, is that the audience can be distracted by information that's perfectly clear and obvious on, on this side of the screen. So you have to learn how to control that information and how to use it to your advantage. In black and white, in, in the academy square, as you say, um, you could keep things out you didn't want. But I think it did suit the films of the day when they were shooting on sound stages because of their sound problems. Thank you. <laughs> sound problems. We still have them. Uh, leaf blowers today. They had um, their microphone problems. 
So they were doing a lot of two shots, a lot of singles, a lot of over the shoulder shots. Uh, and they just blew that background out, made that close up luminous with a good cameraman. Yeah. Which uh, probably filled the screen, probably filled the screen. But does this mean screen. then that you must spend a certain amount of time yourself looking through the viewfinder? Oh yeah, yeah. Some of the directors don't seem to do that much. It's well, Hitchcock famously did. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think it, um, there's no one way to go. Um, today, people look less through the viewfinder because of the, of the monitor. But I still tend to prefer the viewfinder um, because I grew up with that system. But that's also because I direct from beside the camera, rather than in the... I was, was not aware of this. I've, yeah. One of the only directors I've worked with in the last you know, decade or so that actually stands beside camera. Just, right? yeah, 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 most of the way back in Video Village, where now we've got video cameras in our film cameras that relay back to a monitor that directors traditionally right. look at nowadays. When but, Robert Altman was shooting Kansas City, I was with him, and he never looked at the set at all. He was uh, had his nose buried in the video monitors. Yeah, all well, the it time. takes you know. I mean, a good person can control it, but let's say so less of far less of talents than Robert Altman's. I think make the mistake of either shooting too close or too wide, uh, which is the general problem uh, with with movies, and that is exacerbated with the digital monitor, because you're sitting back there. And, you know, usually it's tented a bit in you know, to keep out the light. And the director's inside there, either verbally or through a mic, is saying, uh, go a little closer. Oh, that's it, that's beautiful. <laughs> but you're composing for a theatre in which your head is this big and this oh, close screen, to the screen. That size. When yeah. you stand back beside the camera, you know, you've basically got a wide-angle, very beautiful lens in your eyes. Uh, and, and you tend to compose, I think, and, and understand the theatrical world better with the naked eye than through the uh, monitor. But also, <laughs> and I'm sure you've, you find it too, the nuances of, in performance, yeah. you can't really tell yeah. them being, you know, half a mile away and, yeah. and so, um, although you spend more time in video now, video release now than you Well, I had to, to on the last two pictures. Yeah. Um, Master and Commander because I couldn't get in there. Yeah. Because the sets were so realistic, they were, you know, I mean, this was the height. This was the height between decks. Yeah, because the, the beams would <laughs> yeah. cloud, cloud your head. We didn't want to build any extra room. We had walls that could fly. But, um, One of the few films that really emphasized that kind of compression of yeah, space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was important. But you know, I think there's no one way to go. I mean, that's what I call, by for me, the von Hindenburg yeah, balloon yeah. theory, which is no one ever talks about what format it was, who was you know, how the framing was. Yeah, yeah. When that balloon's coming down in flames, yeah. um, the power wow. of the image. Yeah, interesting. Um, or the, the, the Zapruder film, tragically, both tragedies. You just go, oh my God. Yeah. And that's in a way what we have to try and do with the film, I think, is to, to whatever relevant degree, <laughs> we have to, in the audience, have them enthralled. Thank you. <laughs> That'll be fine. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that when you're off the set, you have no power at all? No, I was just no, thinking that. <laughs> Should I try it? It's a humbling experience. I can't we're, be a user. We're trying to shoot here. <laughs> we're making a film. We need to be taken down a peg or two, I suppose. This gentleman has come out from America. <laughs> Don't you understand? <laughs> Are we going to, as it, as it were, see you two guys together again in a project sometime? Who knows? Well, yeah, well we'd like to. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I work so infrequently, and Russell's pretty choosy mm. these days, that it's um, the clock is against us somewhat. Not near us, please. <laughs> <laughs> when is knowing your collaborator so well a problem? as opposed to the friction of dealing with somebody you don't know so well, and when that becomes a virtue. I don't think we've had a problem. Uh, have we? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you know what, the people I work with and choose to work with are those people who don't um, carry that particular gene. Uh, and the friction's not necessary because if you look at it another way, and that is, the way I've said sometimes to cast all crew, 
the idea is just outside our reach. I may be the leader of the expedition, but help me to reach it. Well, that's a very romantic notion, you know, that the truth is out there, probably unattainable. Yeah. When you, you, you try and grab hold of it, you touch it, just, just touching coup, didn't the Indians yeah. say that? If you can just touch the, that uh, magical thing, then that's what you're after. How good could the scene be? So therefore, the people I'm working with, like Russell, know that it's not about my ego. Sorry, yes, yes.